don't think anybody's expected to know exactly everything that a law firm does. I mean, lawyers are, you know, trained to be myopic. But to have a sense of how all of it works, you know, just enough to be dangerous, enough to know who to uh, introduce people to is critical. Hello and welcome to the latest in the Leaders with Ambition podcast series. And today I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Mike Mellor. And Mike is Chief Marketing and Business Development Officer at Prior Cashman in New York. So we're going to have a really interesting conversation today, which we'll talk through some of the light bulb moments that Mike's had throughout his life and his career. And, and quite early on, um, he didn't necessarily want to commit to learning. And then he read a, a book, a sociology book, and it was the light bulb moment for him. And it made him really want to commit to learning, but also to understand more societal nuances and to really get to the bottom of why people did things. I think that's very much a theme that's continued throughout Mike's life. Uh, he's worked in finance companies. He's worked in one of the big four. And then he found his love within law firms. And that's somewhere that Mike really has enjoyed working um, as part of a major part of his career. And it's been interesting to hear that there's this real theme again with Mike and his passion for data and how that really does underpin lots of marketeers with the work that they're trying to do with partners to get partners to really buy into what the marketing team can do. Networking is a, is a huge strength of Mike, so we'll talk through some of the networks that he's part of and also how to really utilise networks and pay forward, which, again, the coaching and mentoring theme is very strong in, in Mike and his working life. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mike for him to bring some of his career history to life for you. Mike, over to you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I know uh, I remember us talking earlier and, <clears throat> and making the joke that uh, you know, most people wanted to, uh, not a lot of people wanted to be legal marketers when they grew up. You know, I don't think it really existed. <laughs> uh, most people wanted to be an astronaut or, uh, you know, maybe a lawyer themselves. But yeah. uh, as for me, I was I was actually uh, born with a hockey stick in my hand and could skate before I could walk, basically. Um, I learned how to skate at three and my, my father and grandfather both played professionally. Um, and that was, that was what I wanted to do. You know, I played... Uh, you know, in three teams growing up, lots of lacrosse and football and plenty of concussions and broken bones. And, uh, you know, really was 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 pivoted towards that until about, you know, probably junior, senior year in high school when, you know, kind of realized it's probably is a, a little bit of a harder dream than uh, one might envision. I think there's probably, you know, five Americans maybe playing in, uh, you know, uh, the, the 30 NHL teams these days. So um, obviously a very tough Tough Do you part across. Still, still play now at all, Mike? Is that something um, not really so on? much. You know, uh, I you know I dabbled a little bit after university, but pretty much my I, I peaked at about fifteen or sixteen. So that was, <laughs> uh, but you know, lots of uh, lots of fun, lots of travel. Um, really kind of embedded my love of travel. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, going up to Canada and and you know all that good jazz. So um, yeah, you tra you've traveled to over thirty countries. I remember you telling me, which is amazing. I did, yeah, and that was, you know, basically a, a nice result of all well, thanks to my alma mater, University uh, Maryland, who who gave me a shot. And, Favorite um, country? I, I suppose you've got to say, surely the UK. <laughs> you spent a year in the UK, didn't you? At university, you won a scholarship. I did, yeah. Sort of a long and winding road, you know. I started at uh, started at University of Maryland, and you know, was there for three semesters. Not really quite yeah. sure what I wanted to do. Uh, kind of dabbling around, probably, you know. Uh, heading to house parties a little too much at that time <laughs> and actually, you know, ended up taking after uh, three semesters, took a year off and, you know, um, was, was working in a restaurant and was uh, following my favorite band around, uh, Sam Fish and traveling kind of coast to coast with them and staying in camp sites and, and doing all of that. But uh, yeah, actually, you know, speaking of those light bulb moments, that's where one of them was in, in Burgestown, Pennsylvania at a, a KOA campsite. And I don't know how I stumbled upon this book, but it was, it's called Sociology. It's by Peter Berger and probably just 120 pages and just spun through that, you know, so quickly I and mean, realizing, you know, this is exactly what I think about all the time. I didn't know that there was really a, a term for it, you know, kind of how people and culture interact and, you know, really fell in love with it and realized that, you know, I want to study something, you know, involving people and cultures and uh, came back to Maryland and, you know, it was just laser focused on it from there and 
Uh, I don't think I got to be the rest of my time at, at Maryland. And so the onus of that, you know, I think I, you know, maybe perhaps grab some attention of, you know, this, what's going on with this guy who, you know, was kind of not going to class and is now kind of rocking it and ended up earning a scholarship to study abroad. So that was, that was fantastic. And spent, you know, uh, three months before, you know, traveling from, from jazz fest to jazz fest. You can see the, the travel and music as uh, important components of my life. And uh, yeah, I, you know, bartended at the student union and uh, went to classes, you know, Monday to Thursdays and was jumping on Ryanair flights to go to basically everywhere. And, you know, got to go to probably over 30 countries. Yeah, 35 or something like that. So um, it was it's really fantastic, amazing. not just for the educational component, but you know, obviously you can learn a lot being, uh, you know, sort of embedded in cultures and, you know, learn the more that you know, the more you know you don't know. So it's been, it's been a, a lot of fun. I think it's interesting, isn't it? You know, your passion for, for culture um, sits really well with your passion for travel and the two do have to go hand in hand, don't they? Sure, sure, yeah. So always fun, uh, you know, leveraging any sort of reason to, to get, on a, get on a plane and go meet new people and explore new things and try new foods and you know, try, to, try to learn languages. So I'm really into that. So good, it's amazing. So you left university and you started your first role within a finance firm and you, you were doing a lot of RFP writing at the time, weren't you? Yep, yep, yeah. So, you know, got in just in a, in a marketing role, you know, kind of rewriting websites, doing RFPs, uh, you know, just monster RFPs day after day in the RFP machines. And that was great. Uh, you know, I uh, was also studying at Tufts to... Tufts Harvard Collaborative of Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, um, which my boss had gone to. And, you know, with nice. a couple of us were, were taking those courses, was, which was great, really learning about international relations and international negotiation tactics. And, um, you know, just thinking a lot more globally around, you know, kind of how we're communicating, obviously, as a global organization. Um, so, yeah, I did, did that up in Boston and, and, and finished that and uh, moved down to New York. I had gotten into grad school at Columbia. and um, you know, this kind of integrated marketing communications, which, you know, uh, was, was sort of novel at the time. You know, you, you look at Budweiser, you know, they'll hire a PR firm, they'll hire an advertising firm, they'll hire uh, someone, you know, to sort of address, you know, who we're giving philanthropic uh, funds to. And, and, you know, kind of thinking about how uh, every touch point sort of, uh, you know, is, is all connected uh, is the concept and the underlying concept of integration, integrated marketing communications. And, at the time, Columbia, um, BU, and, and Northwestern were the were the three spots to go. So, I was fortunate to to get into Columbia and moved down to Greenwich Village for a few years, and and that was great. Worked at, worked at Deutsche Bank and uh, and finished that up, and then you know eventually I moved over to uh, the Big Four, which was a really fun job. They had me on a um, essentially a sort of a national flying team, where you know if the if the opportunities were big enough or strategic enough, there was uh, four or five of us who would just kind of pop around and go live in, you know, St. Louis for two weeks when Budweiser, uh, you know, had a pitch or go to Cupertino. Um, so lots of sleeping in conference rooms. And um, <laughs> that was, that was a ton of fun. But, uh, you know, great way to uh, learn as well, being so hands on in the role like that. You learn. Yeah, quickly. yeah. Every yeah. day was sort of a one on one. Yeah. It's an SAP implementation. It's, you know, moving from US GAAP to IFRS. It's ERPs and, and all sorts of different product lines. Um, which was, you know, essentially a wonderful, uh, you know, learning opportunity, and you know, figuring out how to really message that, and helping folks sort of prep for orals, and and uh, you know, putting together all the placemats, and you know, also our RFPs as well. Lots of time on the road, lots of good, uh, good frequent flyer miles. So, uh, <laughs> I <can> imagine. But, <laughs> you know, that was a, that was a young man's game, and you know, <laughs> you know, 19, 19 hour days and those types of things, and then going home and sleeping for three days. Um, really fun but I got to be got to be a bit and I really jumped at the opportunity to move into legal have some some family who were who were lawyers and um obviously a, a ton of smart people um and you know love to kind of soak in that, in that knowledge and I think that's one of the the really interesting things that you mentioned to me as well wasn't it around you know the the intellectual capability of people in law firms and it's you know, you, you are actually you feel like you're part of something special and these are really bright people and it's about how you then find that connection and you have found that connection through that data analysis that you 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 understand that partners have to have a reason why they want to spend their money. So how can you talk a bit through that and, and how you started to really develop 
your, um, your, your love of data? Sure. Uh, I guess I'll start with the intellectual curiosity piece. And, um, yeah. you know, I think that that is just the most important thing that anybody can bring. You know, I don't think anybody's expected to know exactly everything that a law firm does. I mean, lawyers are, you know, trained to be myopic and they're trained to really look at sort of the micro stuff that's going on. And, you know, you just in one industry alone, right? There are developments happening every day. And so, you know, that expectation for you know, a marketer who kind of sits, you know, at the top to, to understand, you know, everything a lawyer does who specializes in something is crazy. But, you know, to have a sense of, of you know, how all of it works, you know, just enough to be dangerous, enough to know who to uh, introduce people to is critical. And, you know, if you, if you use this job right, you know, I, in the margins of every meeting I have, it's something I'm looking up, right? Is that an Investopedia, you know, um, differences, you know, in between Reg D, you know, uh, fundraisers. So, you know, all sorts of different things you could, you could really uh, sink your teeth into. And I think that, you know, the people who, who go come back from a meeting um, and Google things. And then there are people who don't come back from meetings and Google things. And I think that that really sort of separates the people, uh, you know, going up, talking about transmedia IP rights issues and really wanted to delve into that and understand, um, you know, why a podcast, you know, them selling something to a gaming organization, uh, why that would be different and what are the specific rules and, and things like that. And if you care about that, you know, it's, it's, it's contagious. You know, I think that, you know, the folks who know that you're you know, really trying to get into that and, you know, doing weekend reading, um, it shows. And so, you know, I think you get a much better seat at the table for sure. And obviously you can add a lot more value when you understand the players and, and the landscape. So, um, you know, along that same vein, you know, using that information, you know, how can we uh, use, you know, I, I break down data into, into three buckets, industry data, individual data, and internal data. And, you know, she who can combine all three is, you know, winning, winning the game. But, you know, taking that and, and, and using that and not just kind of giving that data to an attorney, but you know, giving the analysis of that. That's, that's where we, you know, get paid the big bucks. That's where we, you know, have the expertise. And so you know, being able to be a little more prescriptive and having that data as backup is critical. You know, it just, uh, you learn to think like a lawyer, you know, what can go wrong here? How are they going to try to blow this up? <laughs> and, um, you know, having all of that, you know, kind of at the ready, uh, if not embedded into into your proposal or into your thinking, you know, really really ends up helping to satisfy, I think, a lot of that uh, skepticism that that attorneys can have. And how long did it take you to recognize how the importance of that, and then you know, be able to put it into play? Still learning. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, one of my favorite lessons, I guess. People always love the failure stories, so yeah, I, I love. Happy I love, to give a couple. You learn. Yeah, um, but, I learn. <laughs> yeah, the first day, you know, I came into into prior, and you know, just kind of seeing how the how things were operating. It's like, all right, we're all going to do this. Here's a firm wide policy, and it was just crickets. Yeah, you know, and I that was you know sort of my first lesson for my first CMO role was you know <laughs> you got to kind of understand your audience and. You know, I kind of after not getting some stuff, I was like, this is so easy. I don't understand why. And, you know, you've got to really get champions. You've got to get people who are aligned with your thinking, who, who trust you. So I, you know, kind of, you know, tucked my tail between my legs and kind of went back for a new day and, you know, started just getting closer with all of the practice group leaders. And, you know, what do we, you know, what matters to you? Why does it matter? Um, just asking the right questions down into, you know, what they're really trying to do. And, um, you know, got, got three or four of them on board and just started showing successes in, in much smaller um, places. And, you know, yeah. you, you get lawyers, uh, you've got to kind of play on that. You know, we talk about gamification a little bit. You got to kind of play on, uh, you know, the things that make attorneys good at what they do. And that's, you know, competitiveness, you know, FOMO. <laughs> yeah. And so, strategically telling those stories around the water cooler about how we doubled somebody's business and set somebody up with a, you know, kind of a new plan or a pipeline or, you know, work with them to, to set up a series of content and, you know, kind of how we're taking those and, and publishing them, you know, in different places, et cetera. And, you know, it, even, even two, two days ago, we had our partnership meeting and, you know, we're, we're talking about who's most viewed and who's doing the most publications, who's, who's giving those out. It's obviously a correlation. And so, 
uh, we've started to you know now get the executive committee and you know our managing partner to kind of help us pound those messages home around just being really active and making sure that your bio is up to date and you know having kind of that digital footprint that's that's current and relevant um, and, and teaching people how to you know mine effectively on LinkedIn and you know how to you know filter yeah. people out and build lists and, and all of that. So it's uh, and, and, and the personal branding so important now for partners isn't it and, and so yeah. it's something you have to to do a lot of your team do a lot of work on with the partners because it's it's huge now yeah yeah no absolutely and you know the the buying cycle has changed mm. you know they're saying that people are you know over 60 percent of the way through the decision making cycle before they're picking up and contacting somebody so what does that mean well that means that you know you have you know maybe you're looking to do an m&a deal you get five attorneys that you know your buddies tell you about are, are rock stars and you go on there and you know, three of them don't have anything, you know, related to whatever. I run a, I run a you know, a, a restaurant. Three of them yeah. don't have anything that say anything about restaurants. Well, I'm instantly down to two. And I might contact those folks and ask them to, you know, sit down with me and kind of figure out the best fit. Now, the other three, you know, may have maybe specialize in restaurants, but they didn't put it there. And, um, you know, you Google that. That's, that's it. You're out of the game before you know you're in it. And so, um, you know, getting people to kind of think that way that, you know, uh, in your absence, uh, your digital footprint is you. Um, and so I'm um, just getting them to pay more attention, you know, to uh, make sure, that, you know, that is constantly reflected um, in all the great work they do. So it's yeah, not, it not that hard, but uh, yeah, there's so much you say they do so much great work. And that's, you know, you want to get that out there, don't you? You want to be able to shout from the rooftops to say this is, this is, you know, their, their personal brand is also around the quality of the work that they're producing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's, it's a constant, you know, and it's difficult, you know, with, with, with law and, you know, a lot of clients are sensitive, you know, for example, our labor and employment clients, we're never going to yeah. tell you, uh, you know, who we represented in some defamation, you know, case per se. Um, you know, there's kind of a lot of different areas that white collar, you know, uh, you're just not going to, not going to happen. So, uh, you know, family law or family law groups as well. So, um, there's, you know, interesting ways to try to sort of market folks while being very sensitive to very sensitive client issues. So we're always trying to find kind of, you know, novel ways for our attorneys to showcase their expertise without. Uh, I think that's great. And I, th I think one of the things as well that struck home to, to me when you and I were talking was that, you know, the, the community and the network that CMOs have in law firms and you know it's this is not it's not trade secrets you're not going to share certain ip with each other but actually mm. community wants to help and support each other which i think is really strong and very interesting yeah it's it's very novel you know i think we were talking oh. you know somebody you know obviously there's never anybody trading you know kind of what's your vision for yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. but you know someone have a uh, you know a template for a partner plan or you know does somebody help me uh, you know I need a photographer uh, we're doing an event and you know everyone's just you know jumping over each other to try to you know be helpful in that way or uh, you know helping people to security jobs or you know just just giving people some kind of frameworks which again are sort of client secrets but um, you know really helpful for someone just getting started or, or coming in and you know LMA has been uh, something just so important to me um, you know coming in and not really knowing anybody and you know it's like you fast forward five years later and you know you know, know everyone <laughs> yeah it's it's great and so you know getting involved and and uh you know building those networks is is, is critical uh, you know i think it might be because of just the 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 tenure of you know legal marketers it tends to be a lot shorter uh shorter fuses i think in in, in legal and um you know, people are, are looking for new opportunities and things like that and so you know, you never know when you're going to, you know, be working with someone again, or, you know, you, or you have worked with them in the past. And um, it's a pretty small world when it comes to it. So people tend to you know, really help each other out kind of knowing, knowing long term. And, um, you know, again, I don't think that uh, I think the toughest part about being in legal marketing is just trying to put, you know, we all understand what what success looks like and what that utopia is, but trying to get that into, you you know, a very nuanced firm is an entirely other story and no one can solve that yeah. problem for and so um you know I, I say that we have some very different roles each cmo um very different whereas i think if you went to the big four a director does the same thing as this director 
it's yeah, all, it's all kind it of fits well. things in through yeah. that lens of culture. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I think that's a really important point. And, and, you know, I remember one of the comments that you made to me, which again resonated, was this, you know, uh, belief in that if you're in a firm, understand the firm, understand the culture, understand the politics, because then actually, you, you know, your, your lens is going to change, isn't it? It's going to be a little different. That's it. And, you know, um, the international negotiations class came in uh, pretty handy about, you know, understanding that you know, everyone's different. They may not all success looks very different to them. So asking the right questions, you're able to sort of slot in things that this person yeah. really cares about this and this person really cares about this. So if that make them second in this, but again, you've got to know, um, you know, what's more important, you know, maybe for this partner, it's WTR, World Trademark Review is more important than Chambers. Great. Okay, now we get to pitch this person for this, and we can back this one up here. And uh, you know, in terms of speaking opportunities, you know, you can assume that this person, you know, loves luxury because they are constantly, uh, you know, have those clients. But in fact, are really more an apparel person, and they, they just happen to get luck. Hey, if you're asking those questions, you now can kind of, you know, reprioritize uh, people, and you know, hopefully make everyone happy enough. Um, you know, we're never going to make everyone happy uh, as legal marketers. It's impossible. But, um, you know, just making decisions based on knowledge. And that, that, again, comes back to intellectual curiosity. Yeah. And I think also one of the things that uh, you said about really being prepared when you're walking into a meeting as well. And, you know, be really respectful of people's time. Because, again, you know, lawyers are, are busy people by the nature of the beast. Of course, um, UCMOs and marketers are very busy people as well. But you've got to make sure that you're always as prepared as possible. And then you're going into a situation knowing what to expect. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's not just the busyness, but if you're thinking like a, like an entrepreneur, every minute that you bother an attorney. Yeah, yeah. Right? We the more that we can keep attorneys billing and we can take things off their plate, the more successful the firm is because, you know, we don't charge hourly. This isn't, you know, some sort of net zero thing. So, you know, how are we, you know, I watched, uh, you know, a couple of LMA presentations, you know, about this, creating a skunk works consulting firm, which is uh, these build and consulting people we talked about. And it's brilliant, you know, you we you know, not, uh, you know, if you're sort of resending an email, you know, you, including the attachment again, again, breaking stuff down, uh, making it's it really easy, easy yeah. so, that, so that they're not running around. What was that thing I was supposed to send to you? Just bring it all to them and, you know, really uh, advance the ball. I, I strategically write a, a lot of my emails and they take, you know, probably four minutes to read and it takes me 25 minutes to build it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's super organized and hi, here's exactly what you need to do. That's in red. These are the three things I need. They'll make them search for stuff. You know, I think that those are some some great lessons. But it is, yeah, it comes down to down to respect and, and understanding understanding the business. You know, the more that attorneys are are building, you know, the better off we all are. The safer our jobs all are. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, anything you can do to 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 help that, I think it also, you know, again elevates you. And you know, this is a lot about branding. You know, it's the, uh, what do they say, the best compliment you can get in a law firm is more work and kind of okay. true. Um, okay. I always get a little scared, you know, when people are. <laughs> and what about the word sale? Sales, because we, you know, talked about this and, you know, sometimes it can be seen as a bit of a dirty word in, in law firms, but, well, you know, we're always selling. <laughs> yep. No, it's, that's it. Everyone's in sales. Um, you know, when you're, you know, I've read, some, some books are out. It's, you know, when you're growing up and you're trying to get your parents to change your curfew, right? I mean, you're in sales. You're, you're uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, trying to get an upgrade in, in, out of flight. That's, you're selling at, at the end of the day. So, you know, I think that the lawyers could, could do well to, you know, just kind of embrace that a little more effectively. I think there's still some of that uh, laws of craft. But at the end of the day, you know, clients don't think that way, right? We're, you know, just like consultants, you know, we add value, but, you know, in many cases, it's sort of necessary to, to happen. They get sued. They didn't necessarily want a, an attorney and didn't want this, you know, coming at them. And, and here it is. So, you know, what can you do to add value? How are you taking your advice and contextualizing it uh, within an industry? And I, I think you're seeing that more and more with lawyers realizing, hey, you know what, I really need to specialize. There's no way I can know every industry. Um, but if I, you know, really become an amazing agricultural M&A person, you know, I'm thinking about 
you know, stocks and weather and, and, and contextualizing my, you know, warranties and reps, uh, you know, within the fact that, you know, I work in a, in a seasonal business. And so, you know, just having that sort of uh, additional layer, I think is, is critical. And I think that clients are better off for it. Um, all these things are, are often driven by clients, whether yeah. it's feedback or, it or industry yeah. specialization or, you know, yeah. pushback on hours or pushback on rates. Yeah, it's a, I really like what you were saying about the um, that you just mentioned about the emails as well, making it, you know, it's a four minute email, but you it's taking you 20, 25 minutes and then coming up with, and this is what you need to do in red. I think that's a fantastic idea. Actually, yeah. <laughs> implement it on picture. <laughs> I think it's great. And are you, you know, you and I've talked a lot about um, mentoring, coaching, giving back, paying forward. And I know that you're really, really passionate, aren't you, about some of the networks that you belong to and also about mentoring and coaching. You know, how how do you find the time and why is it so important? I just think it's, you know, kind of equal parts of quality and, you know, getting something that, you know, either you were given or um, maybe something you weren't. <laughs> Um, you know, I, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't, you know, have, uh, you know, my resume really built up. I was working in restaurants and this and that, but I was, you know, fortunate enough to come from a, a great background and, you know, my parents knew how to help me and, and manage that situation. And obviously I was understanding that, that now people sort of were blessed with that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you combine that with the fact that Maryland, you know, really, really stuck their neck out for me. They gave me a shot, uh, really got me involved in a lot of you Maryland um, so whether that's hosting interns for the day uh, at prior cashman or whether you know, I'm involved in three or four different sections where we're doing uh, mock interviews and uh, resume reviews and um, so you know, raising my hand every semester for those and just you know really trying to stay involved and and show my appreciation and pay it forward and so you know you take that in in LMA as well um, you know certainly when you when you join you were you know, drinking from the fire hose, uh, created this body of knowledge. You know, Tim Corcoran helped to lead that as well. And you know, really a lot of resources in terms of these templates and frameworks uh, and thinking uh, that you can, you can you know, have full access to, to the extent you want it. I haven't even gone down deep, deep in the throes, but I've certainly you know, uh, noodled around there and you know, been able to find exactly what I need. And it's just, it's fantastic. And so, you know, you kind of, you know, get to a point where you kind of come from the, you know, reader to the creator, I guess, as it were. And, um, you know, that's just, it's, it's rewarding to, you know, have people kind of reach out to you and want to do informational interviews or uh, want to kind of pick your brain for stuff. And um, I know it's really helpful to me. I have mentors and, uh, you know, obviously uh, I want to pay it forward as well. I think that's great. And I think, you know, as you say, the, the power of mentoring is for at all levels, whether it's with your peers, you know, whether it with, with more junior people. I think there's not enough people that really um, take value from it or don't or recognize the value. And as soon as you do, or you've had a successful mentor mentee relationship, you get it, don't you? It's getting another light bulb moment. You go, right. <laughs> that's right. And now, you know, with the advent of all this technology, you know, us, us old geezers, you know, also can, uh, can, can, you know, clean is not sort of a one way thing. And then when you get to this level, you're doing, you know, chat GPT, a lot of this AI stuff, you know, a lot of us old folks could do well to be learning from, you know, some of the younger folks who, you know, this is their second language, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I still am, you know, very involved, obviously in marketing, you're still really involved in social media and, you know, understanding, um, you know, kind of what works and what doesn't, but uh, certainly the technologies are just going to continue to, to evolve. So I think there's, you know, a lot of symbiotic relationships that can happen across generations, sort of up and down the workforce and across the workforce to yeah. uh, help us all to be better. So what, what is the policy that you guys have on technology, on AI technology at the moment, bringing it into the firm? Is it, is it, <clears throat> is it let's give it a go and see what happens, or is it a little bit more structured? <clears throat> I, I think it's really more of a wait and see approach. Um, no, I think where uh, you know you don't have client-specific things. I think that we're not one of those firms that's going to be first to market in terms of how we uh, you know are growing resources at developing this AI stuff. And I think we yeah. kind of let it let it run its course a little bit and make sure that it's it's a little more stress tested. You know, obviously there's Why? a lot of ramifications <laughs> there. Um, so you know you've got to 
you, you got pretty skeptical attorneys and, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, some existential <laughs> questions. So yeah. um, for right now, we're, you know, we're using it a little bit and, and, you know, in marketing, you know, thinking about open ocean analysis and competitive intelligence and, you know, using it for SEO purposes and, you know, what are you know, top search, search terms? Can you use it for, you know, what are, what are buying triggers for, you know, folks who are seeking legal services? Um, I think those things are uh, no brainers. You know, I think that they're, you know, obviously a lot less risk in that uh, than, you know, telling somebody about some you know, precedent that maybe got confused in the ether or something like that. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're trying to use it strategically and improve its value. You know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, attorneys in some pockets are probably, you know, toying with it here and there, but uh, from an enterprise perspective, we're going to, um, you know, we, we run lean, so we don't, you know, we're not going to, you know, chucking a bunch of resources into that uh, at the moment. So uh, yeah. probably more of a wait and see approach will probably be in the second wave. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how everything spans out. Won't it? It's just going at such a fast speed. Um, Unbelievable. And the law is not really, you yeah, know, caught up to... The law isn't uh, keeping up. You're correct. No. Yeah. I find it fascinating, particularly in law firms. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So um, the, the, the power of networking that I know that you've mentioned about the LMA Association and obviously how great that has been for you as an individual and also for so many people in it. What is it that makes the LMA so special? Because yeah, I was at you know, recently. It's an, it is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was, you know, I don't know. I got there and it's been it's been this way. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I've got to look to our to our elders, uh, I guess, um, in terms of the just the the love, truly, that's kind of created around there. Um, you know, I just had a had a wonderful time, uh, you know, meeting you and and seeing you in in in, um, in Hollywood, Florida. Um, and it's just it's just good energy. You know, I think that you know no one's there to uh, you know I, I want to look really good. You know, that's not what. It's about, it's about is it now? It's so <clears throat> inclusive, I felt as well, which is, which is, I think, for a network or an organization, is, is what you want, isn't it? Yeah. And these fishbowl concepts that we were employing, where everyone can kind of come in and, and have a, an opportunity to participate. Uh, and other folks coming in who aren't necessarily illegal, who are just thinking about, you know, whether that's sales or retention. And maybe we're getting one of our like vendors, strategic partners in there talking about, you know, their struggles sort of in the SaaS space. Well, yeah. you know, it is relevant, right? And it is, um, you know, a cool data point that, you know, we, we're all kind of, you know, continuing to learn from. And I think everyone's, everyone's just got a, you know, a chance to speak, a chance to raise their hands. And it's really fun to watch the people who are really into it, watch them just rock it up. Our buddy Jacob from New York is, you know, I remember five years ago, and he you know, kind of joined uh, maybe, maybe a little longer, but, you know, kind of got really involved in LMA and just watching this kid. Uh, man you know kind of rock it up and it's just yeah. it's, everyone's excited for him That's and you know, it just gets gets a new role and you know this stuff really builds your confidence it really builds your ability to, to delegate and kind of you know, work with different people and um I've been, you know, I think on a committee basically every year since I've joined. And which again is a commitment from you, which shows, <clears throat> you know, your time gets pushed in all the time, doesn't it? We never, we never have enough time. So the fact that you've committed and that amount of time to be a committee member shows that you really believe in it. So I think that's a really positive thing. And what about, what, what would you say have been your challenges then throughout your career? Oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think that, you know, we, we kind of come back to, you know, LMA, right? And how, how, are, how are people, you know, people share information that might be, you know, some deck. That's not the hard part, right? The hard part is how do you affect change in uh, a place that's, you know, rocking and rolling and, you know, you're not an attorney and you know, how does all this work? And, you know, as my dad loves to say, you know, it's tough to walk into a group of millionaires and tell them they're wrong. And, you know, it's a pretty, pretty valid, uh, pretty valid comment you know you know you may see a, a more efficient and effective way to do things but what's the onus for their change why do they care you know hey i'm doing great i put you know seven dollars in my pocket and you know all's well and I'm, i i like how it's going okay well i could give you ten dollars if you you know just do this thing well you know we can be more effective i can give you an hour of your life back you know You've got to figure out, you know, what's in it for me, and that's just, you know, a mission critical part of of any change management is, 
Now, what's the benefit for them? People are busy. You know, they're not just going to sort of change doing their default. So there's a lot of interesting psychology around that. Mm. You know, there's a, I don't know if you ever read the book Nudge, but it's, uh, you know, they basically they did a, um, they did a study where, you know, half the people who started, they, you know, said, hey, we're going to have your 401k, you know, your retirement plan, it's going to be matched. We're going to take out, you know, hundred bucks out of your thing. If you want to change it, let us know. And the other half of the people, they didn't do that. And people are like water. They're just going to kind of do the easier thing. And so uh, kind of having opt out strategies as opposed to opt in strategies. Yeah. Um, you know, I say, hey, we're going to do this unless we hear from you, as opposed to saying, please give me your approval. Um, those little things can go a long way in terms of uh, helping you to achieve your objectives and, and the firm's objectives. Um, and, you know, just really positioning things that, you know, people don't care about the about the features of something, they care about the benefits. And so, um, you know, just being able to kind of do that extra step for them um, and, and let them know that, you know, hey, they're going to be saving time, money, or, or a combination of both. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. And um, I know that you, uh, obviously, throughout your career as well, it's been very people focused. And I think that's also, you know, it's, it's a challenge at times, isn't it? But also it's something that I think you probably see as a highlight as well, because you love to see people developing, don't you? And to see those, again, the light bulb moments when you're coaching and mentoring people. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. I've always thought it was you know, more unique to sell people than as opposed to widgets. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, and anything we do, it's, it, it is a people business. And, yeah. You know, just like, uh, just like I, you know, we'll never know, you know, how it rocks in a courtroom, uh, you know, just, just getting a seat at the table to help people to be more organized, more effective, follow up, uh, narrow narrow their focus. I think that you know a lot of people, you know, think their audience is everyone, everyone with a case, and it's just not that's that's not how it is, and it's exhausting for you, right? Yeah. Then you've got to go to seventeen different conferences, and you got to figure this, and you know you're not really making inroads with anybody. You're a jack of all trades and sort of a master of none. And so, you know, if you decide that you're going to be you know, the restaurant attorney, um, your life becomes inherently easier because you know that these three events are the things you need to go to. You know that these 20 and anything else that kind of comes into your into your email inbox uh, that's not restaurant focused yeah. is noise. Yeah. So and so um, yeah. it's just a lot more easier to be effective. Everyone's busy. And, you know, 10 out of 10 times a restaurateur is going to hire a restaurant attorney, you know, but yeah. You know, it's uh, that that's kind of the conversation is that specialist to industry, uh, you know, generalist to industry specialist. And, you know, it's thanks to the clients who are demanding it more and more. And, you know, it aligns wholly with my thinking. So um, I'm loving it. And it's great to become a specialist as well, isn't it? I mean, you, as you say, you, you know, you get such a lot from it personally, I think. So it makes a big difference. And, and what about words of wisdom? What words of <clears> wisdom <throat> do you give to um, my, maybe Mike when he was, Back playing the ice hockey. <laughs> <laughs> probably should have got out of the way of a few more pucks. <laughs> probably it. But, you know, I, I think it's, you know, really, really investing in yourself by, you know, taking extra time, learning about things, you know, investopedia, you know, people, who, if you're going and sitting there and trying to get, you know, 1% better every day, I think yeah. that's, you know, really a big concept that, uh, you know, Kaizen, uh, Japanese uh, concept around, just getting a little better every day all of a sudden you look and you're you know 20 percent better so you know what are you doing today to to uh you know read stuff and, and and learn stuff and 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 position yourself more effectively and you know i think that that manifests itself also in you know how you come to meetings you know printing things out having things ready kind of thinking like an attorney you know what what could go wrong how am i gonna how, how can it look better someone's gonna show up they're not gonna have read this okay can we maybe have a little bulleted thing when we're sending a reminder for the too long didn't read sort of thing? Or are we are we preparing for you know the questions that could come up in a strategic planning session? And I think that those things go a long way. It's 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 a sign of respect, and you know people enjoy when you respect their time, and uh, especially really busy folks, especially when they're your boss. So yeah. um, <laughs> they're paying. Uh, <laughs> they want that. And and I think um, I I don't I know that you said to me in the past about this real feeling that you have of treating everybody 
and holding them to this really high standard but to do that that you may need to treat people differently at different times and I think that was something that you really thought mm -hmm. following the COVID pandemic didn't you? Yeah yeah you know just you know, you're kind of we're still I guess it's in the rear view I'm not really quite sure but I don't know uh, where we are yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, I see it in the side view anyway yeah you know just learn so much as a you know, when you're a leader, obviously your first time leader or, you know, whatever, you, you're you going to make some mistakes and, and hopefully grow from them. But, you know, the COVID really, you know, did teach me a, a different level of empathy uh, in regards to that. You know, some people have kids, some people have, you know, parents they're caring for, you know, maybe, you know, different illnesses. So you kind of, you know, you, you, you treat everyone the same, uh, sort of, you know, give everyone, you know, kind of the Everyone has, you know, required to respond to the same policies and procedures, but there are, you know, things that you need to sort of individualize for people because people are individual. And so, you know, just all about communication, right? Yeah. If you, you know, are telling me, you know, you need to go and drive your, you know, your grand, your parent to, you know, a doctor's office, just let me know so I can jump in on that hour. You know, if you're leaving and you're not saying anything, uh, you know, that thing sits there and I could have done it in four minutes and now we look bad. And so, you know, just covering for people and you know they cover for me and um, on numerous uh, occasions um, and so I think it's just about you know really creating that transparency so that um, it's seamless to the partners you know we I say the same thing with you know we'll get we'll get phone calls where they call the wrong person and you know how are we uh, that's just going to happen because you know they develop sort of favorites in the group or whatever that is and how are we making sure that every time they talk to one of us they're talking to everyone so, yeah that building marketing calendars is that just you know sharing you know slack channels or what you know whatever it is you work with you know just being being better than that to offset those types of things i think that you know uh, i get i get grabbed in the hallway all the time and someone's asking me for uh, you know some sort of press related thing i know that's my colleague brian but you know i've got to come back build that in and make sure that everyone's just uh, you know operating in all cylinders so yeah, I think as you say, it's making it as easy as possible for the partners is, is essential, isn't it? When you're in a business services function, that's what that's what the job's there for. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Mike. Really enjoyed speaking to you and hearing more about you, what makes you tick. And also thank you for sharing words of wisdom to us. I've definitely taken away the fact that networking is about investing and also paying it forward uh, for your community and groups as well. So thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for having me, Nikki. It's been a pleasure.